Our panel consists of Adam from Medtronic. Yeah, I know that. From Medtronic. I just wanted to know, I was trying to decide whether to include your last name, Dawkins. Bart DeMarshall, Dr. DeMarshall, from, it took me about a year to get, because his name is not spelled the way it looks, <laughs> not, at least not to Americans. From the, runs telemedicine, uh, neuro, teleneuro at the Mayo Clinic. And Dr. DeHagam from IBM Watson. And I pronounced that correctly, I hope. So the, the first thing I'm gonna ask is what we, I'm gonna ask each of them to speak briefly on the following. And then we're gonna open this completely up to you. And that is, what do you see as the main challenges in the connected health arena uh, today, and how are we going about solving them? So we'll just start from the far corner, sure. doctor, and sure. then we'll come this way, all right? Sure. Dr. Sure. Dahagam. Sure. Just I two minutes each, if you don't mind. Two minutes, okay. Yeah. Can you guys sure. hear me okay? Can anyone out there hear me? Okay, well, maybe I'll hold it up like this. That might be better. Is that okay? You really want to hold it up for no? an hour? Well, you know, I got, I you know, got, I know my you're tools. A tech guy. I got tools. I got to use yeah. my hands. They um, can hear you. Yeah. Um, no, thank you very much. And, and thanks, everyone, for uh, letting me participate here. Uh, you know, when we think about the connected health and the challenges, you guys will hear me beat a dead horse. It's what I do, uh, especially because I'm talking tomorrow, and you'll hear it again. But there's really three, I think, critical boxes that have to be checked, at least three. Um, and we all are on the same page, I think, here. Uh, clinical is the first one. That's just because of my background. Um, that's where I lead. And, and the clinical box, I think, is going to be a big challenge. And when we think clinical, it, it encompasses a lot. It talks about, number one, patient outcomes, uh, quality and efficiency. Um, and we talk a lot about bending the cost curve. I'm all about bending the value curve, so quality over cost. That's what we have to focus on, so clinical. But then there's also clinical... The, just the culture that we live in. We saw it yesterday with ZDog MD. For every one ZDog, there's 100 Flanders out there. So that's a big clinical box that has to be kind of addressed. How do we change the culture? A lot of the younger docs, if they haven't left like me, <clears throat> they are staying in it and they're going to be the ones that really uh, you know, help some of this team-based care, technology integration, and so forth. So that's one. Then th that's a segue to the second box, which is technical. Um, really figuring out how can health systems that are stuck in the past rely on these new technologies when their margins are razor thin, if positive at all, and implement the infrastructure necessary to connect with all this cool stuff that's happening outside of the hospital. Um, and that's some of the stuff I'll be talking about tomorrow. And then the third is, we can categorize it as operational, business, financial, finance, whatever. It's the segue from the technical. How do you pay for all this? How do hospitals and health systems pay for all this? How do you transition from one of pure revenue, where we in the IT world are guilty of focusing on a lot of, uh, and look at it as a cost savings. Financial is not a revenue generation. It's how much are we saving, then how do we apply that in a, as, as a risk averse a way as possible. So that's, that's my soapbox. And, and, you know, when you look at what, what are we back on here, are you hearing me? You can leave this on all the time. I won't uh, talk unless spoken to. Uh, what we have here is someone from IBM, someone who is enacting telehealth, Dr. DeMarshall right now, and of course Medtronics, which is involved both with the development uh, and the implementation. So Dr. DeMarshall, uh, what do you see as the challenges? You're already... Uh, running a program that's world-renowned uh, in Teleneuro. But what are the challenges that still remain? So one of, the, one, of the, one of the enjoyable things about participating in a panel is that we can, uh, as panelists, we can focus attention on, on slightly different aspects and themes to ensure that you in the audience hear a, hear a, a balanced perspective or a, in, a, in a, a broad perspective. I'll say before I begin that I'm keenly interested to hear what the audience members have to contribute. I think I can speak for, for all of us. We're, we're as interested in hearing or more interested in hearing uh, the challenges that you have faced within your own organizations and potential solutions as, as, uh, as you may be in, in hearing our stories uh, and this entire this entire uh, uh, or uh, this entire media and conference has has allowed us uh, all of us ample time for for sharing and for that I'm grateful uh, to, to the organizers and, and hosts uh, I, I I'm going to share 
a, uh, a, a, a I agree with I agree with what you've already heard. I'm going to share a different challenge, uh, and that's and that's for an organization like Mayo Clinic that that represents the clinical practice. Uh, research and education, the, the, the three shields of, of Mayo Clinic. Uh, one, of the, one of the major challenges we have with our Center for Connected Care is, is, is understanding the role of the center somewhere in between developing the science and, and implementing the science of healthcare delivery into the practice. And, and Understanding where a center for telehealth or a center for virtual care or connected care fits in that continuum. <clears throat> uh, uh, on a related note, on a related note, our organization, I think, like many of yours, have have experienced innovative innovative personnel, whether they be clinical, or administrative, allied health, or otherwise that have developed tremendous ideas, but have done so in a relative, relative silo within the organization, uh, and continue to do so. And the last, thing, the last thing any organization would want is a center for telehealth to stifle that innovation and creativity. Um, <clears throat> the center should facilitate it, but, but needs to in, in some way incorporate it into, uh, into, the, into the broad institutional objectives, vision, strategy. And, and this, this continues to be a challenge for our, for our organization. <clears throat> um, we're, we're not sure yet exactly where the Center for Connected Care fits between the science and the practice. Should it, should it span the entire spectrum? In other words, should it have a role and responsibility in asking the important research questions, helping to find grant support to, 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 uh, to complete a, a research protocol, analyze the result, understand whether it's effective or ineffective, and, and move a project forward all the way through to implementation? Or, 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 should, that, or should that fall, for example, in, a, in the realm of science of healthcare delivery or research in the organization? And the same is true in, on the practice end one would one would think or we've we've observed that at the moment a center for connected care is firmly in the practice end but as but as telehealth becomes commonplace we anticipate that many of the clinical departments really won't um, really won't conceptualize telehealth as being something unique or different and, and, and will conceptualize it as, as just being one of the facets of, of, their, of their practice. And the clinical departments may have a much larger role to play than any center for telehealth. So the, the, final, the final note I'll, I'll, I'll make is conceptualizing the, the role of decentralization and centralization within an organization. <clears throat> Uh, at, at Mayo Clinic, we've conceptualized uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, illustrated uh, the early years of telehealth at Mayo Clinic was one of decentralization where individual divisions, departments, members, innovators, people creative have developed programs. Now we're at a phase where we're attempting to centralize everything related to telehealth to ensure that, that, that the needs of the organization are met at large from patient perspective as well as the provider perspective. But we imagine that, that in the future, things will be largely decentralized again and perhaps much more the responsibility of practice. So, so in summary, one of our greatest challenges is understanding the role of a center for telehealth as you span from the science to implementation of practice uh, in virtual care. And you know, in talking about that role, uh, Dr. DeMarshall, and which in order to segue to Dr. Dawkins of Medtronics, uh, which is, if I don't misspeak here, a commercial company, uh, then uh, this morning I did an interview on CBS uh, uh, radio, and the host, who shall remain nameless, said to me, well, uh, you know, tell us the advantages and disadvantages of telehealth if the patient is in his or her bed at home talking to the doctor, how can the doctor make the diagnosis? So 
There you have a misconception of a supposed radio journalist about what telehealth is. So how do we, and we're, I'm gonna put this to all of you, but since Medtronics is in the business of bringing its innovations <laughs> to the public, how do we dispel some of those uh, misconceptions as well as what do you see are the challenges? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, let me start with the challenges. And so, interesting that we're talking in various ways about technology. And again, the, the, the different markets. There's the fitness and health I mentioned, there's the direct delivery of care which is outside hospitals, and there's care within hospitals. So you can actually say they're slightly different um, areas, though they're going to connect together in the future. Though we're talking about technologies, I think one of the greatest challenges and the thing that gives one the most pleasure is actually it all comes down to being about relationships. So healthcare is traditionally pretty paternalistic. It's telling people what to do. Um, it's very easy just to say one needs to involve the patient, so focus groups or whatever. I think it's a stage beyond that, which is really saying what kind of relationship is one trying to foster and what's that relationship going to lead to. In other words, just because you have a dialogue, it's actually offering choices and where it goes. So I think one of the things really is being very clear what that relationship is. Also in kind of defining the relationship, by definition, I think we're all probably middle class, educated, and we're, we're employed. The kind of solutions, if we end up being for that group of people who these, um, there's an affinity, you can see how people naturally, this is the way they want to do things. The people in some ways one most needs to reach are people for whom they don't have some of the advantages. They may not want to communicate in the same way. It's always an option, though I think what is really exciting about this is not being paternalistic and perhaps the old model. There are times where people do want somebody to be paternalistic, and there are some people who do want it. So I think this is around not being simplistic, but really thinking about what are quite complex relationships. So that's one of the challenges. The second challenge is I just put is thinking in terms of some of the companies which are and some of the you know some of the programs which are involved in this. A little story, I, a little anecdote I often say is in Britain, um, where I come from. Though I, the U.S. is my home, and I'm a U.S. citizen. There's often around Christmas time a bumper sticker that says, a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. And I kind of say, if you're going to get involved in these programs, you're developing those relationships, you're changing the way that people receive care. It's for life, not just for Christmas. And I think that there are a lot of programs, and I think there are a lot of companies, who basically think, you know, this is just a project, it's time limited. Or our exit strategy is we would like to be bought out. They haven't really think, thought long term, where is this going? Um, and I think you've got to be, if this is going to be successful, you've really got to think what it's going to be in the long haul and how that relationship is going to take place. In terms of you know, commercial companies and other things, healthcare is changing. I mean, we've heard around the whole idea of healthcare changing, the idea of what value is um, involved in healthcare, <laughs> where value sits. It means not just commercial companies in the vice segment, but pharma, um, hospitals, primary care, you name it. Every player in the, um, in the field delivering health care is rethinking where they are and also have been very focused on saying, well, what is the value? So I think in that interesting equation, we're seeing these various technologies coming in. And I think you know, it's a very exciting and fertile area. And again, it's about relationships, not just the relationship clinically, but it's also relationships between payers and providers and the other different kind of players which this different field is allowing. Which is why we created this conference, because again, <laughs> as I've said a couple of times in the last couple of days, it's really about getting the thought leaders together and talking not just about the innovations, but about their implement, implementation as well as, in some cases, reimbursement and finding the best way to make sure that what is needed is received by the right people. Can we put the lights up? Yeah. Now, keeping in mind that, uh, and I'm probably gonna understate in each case uh, what you do and what your companies do, uh, we have uh, Dr. Dahagam who is representing a technology, among other things, company, mm -hmm. right? That's right. That's right. Uh, Dr. DeMarshall, who's representing one of the leading health and medical institutions in the world, and Dr. Dawkins, who is representing perhaps uh, the most 
among the most successful, uh, innovative, both in terms of device and other uh, um, implementations. So if you would address your question, Gabby is gonna go around with the mic, what I'd like you to do, I gotta play the sheriff here for a minute. We've got 45 minutes, uh, all right? I need you to keep your question short, not a one and a half minute statement followed by a question. I'd like you to keep your question short. You can direct it to any one of the three that you would like to direct it to, uh, and I will then play with it, and we may move it around, okay? But please stand up, let Gabby hold on to the mic, ask your question, uh, introduce yourself as well. There's a reason for this. Uh, I want as many of you to get a chance as possible. And if somebody spends 10 minutes asking a question or holds on to the mic in order to have a dialogue, we will not get as many of you as we would like to. This comes from 26 years of dealing with this, so trust me. And if you don't trust me, too bad. So anyway, <laughs> but do please. And just as a reward, we have a cocktail party at 515, which is not on the schedule, so you know. Uh, 530? I'm going to start drinking at 515. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, don't we have a device out there that can just start putting it in? All right, folks. So just raise your hand, and Gabby, who I can't see, oh, there she is, is in back, will come over to you. Anything you want to ask about implementation, about devices? If you have no questions, I'm going to really have to dance here. And so, not, not, not only their questions, but to share their feelings answers to your question about challenges within their own organizations about implementation. OK, so your, your ideas as well about how to meet some of these challenges. Anyone? Let's get the ball rolling. Right next to you, Gabby. If you'd stand yeah. up and introduce Hello. yourself, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, I learned my lesson. <laughs> Clear, clearly, Francisco, you have not learned your lesson. Maybe now you have. I'm a slow learner, right? Siete, <laughs> say. For Mayo Clinic, doctor, uh, obviously, your organization has been very successful in selling their knowledge. Like, for instance, you have an association with Palomar Hospital in San Diego. Actually, it's Condido, right? Right out of San Diego. Do you see that you know, happening more where the major knowledge centers um, share their knowledge? And that is another way, is that another way for hospitals to get extra revenues? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So your question is, for the audience, is centered around the concept of, of health organizations uh, developing affili an affiliative model a collaborative or affiliative model as opposed to uh, a, uh, a model in which one organization may buy out smaller health facilities. And the, the Mayo Clinic has elected to expand upon its Mayo Clinic care network a by subscription affiliate model and uh, offer a, a, port a portfolio of offerings from the parent organization or from the Mayo Clinic uh, proper to the affiliates, uh, which include some connected care uh, offerings such as e-consultation, Ask Mayo Clinic Expert, as well as uh, a reputational value. Uh, there, there is, there is a, uh, also a component of, of uh, reduced costs of, of uh, uh, acquiring hospital and healthcare related products uh, by, by uh, buying on, on mass. <clears throat> uh, I, first of all, I think that uh, yes, the, the probability is high that large organizations will continue to adopt a affiliate model. I think, I think we're, we're, we're witnessing that uh, uh, not just from Mayo Clinic, but from other institutions. And, and, uh, for this audience, I think it's it's in particularly relevant that it's likely that these affiliate models or net or networks um, will serve as as the as the lattice or substrate or network for uh, virtual care programs uh, <clears throat> to follow, 
And so I, I, that's 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 uh, the concept that uh, that's that's the concept that what may have started as a Mayo Clinic Care Network with a small portfolio of offerings will likely grow to a large menu of connected care offerings that could be available uh, to the affiliate partners to select from. And some some facilities may choose two of. 20 offerings and others might be interested in 15 uh, and 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 uh, the, a, a package could be could be tailored to uh, to those health systems needs and in addition to that and I'd, I'd like to turn to both of you as well um, although the question was directed really at health organizations uh, I mean we at uh, um, care connection and land are in the business of interpretive services, but also in connecting hospitals with other hospitals and experts. So I'd like to ask you first, Dr. Dawkins, what, in terms of connectivity, we're not only talking about telehealth here now, we're talking about the pillow that a patient takes home, which is in a sense telehealth, to read his or her cardiogram, blood pressure, weight, uh, the uh, IBM Watson and what it's going to be able to do in the future. Let me turn first of you, first of all, to you, Dr. Dawkins, and uh, what is Medtronic's doing to help improve this connectivity and availability to uh, the public as well as health organizations? So, a couple of things. Firstly, um, Medtronic acquired a, just over two years ago a company that does connected health. Um, it's now Medtronic Care Management Services, so a company which does monitoring of people um, with um, chronic disease. So Medtronic is involved in actually doing that kind of remote monitoring, a successful company that um, is, fits into the equation. Secondly, um, th there's been a long history of Medtronic working to actually provide data to patients with some of its devices so that patients can engage it with it with their physicians. And that's really an emerging area in terms of how this involvement between patient and um, provider. And really Medtronic is, is providing ways in which to enhance that relationship. So again, I really come back to the fact that really it's, it's around the engaged patient is bringing together a different stakeholders, one of which is, is Medtronic. Medtronic has a sort of very long history um, Interestingly, I mean, it was founded by an um, engineer in Minneapolis. He, um, when he was training as an engineer, he, his wife was a nurse, and after she finished waiting for her for her shift, he would sometimes be there, and he got drawn in to do some things in the hospital, started a business involved with medical devices. And it was to solve a problem where somebody came to him and said, Earl, we've had a child who's died. They died because... The pacemakers at the time, huge great boxes, which had external leads that went into the plugs, had failed with the power supply in the hospital. He was asked, could he do something? He f used a metronome, actually metronome, and designed from that the first pacemaker. One of the things which really typified the, country, the company has been really a relationship between physician and the company, really working very closely with providers. So I mean, this whole piece around how, as patients are being drawn very rightly and as they should be into the equation of decision making, so Medtronic is trying to help facilitate that in the way that it has and working closely with physician partners to be able to really help be part of this change in healthcare. Uh, when you first told the story, I thought you were going to tell me the doctor uh, used telemetry, and I'm using that correctly, uh, Jamie. <laughs> to talk to his wife, because they were both so busy. <laughs> uh, you, know, so you never know. Lousy audience, I'll tell you. Wasn't that funny? <laughs> All right. Dr. DeHagen, what yes, do you have to say? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll answer this one with my technical hat on, or technology hat on. I think that where IBM really thrives, and, his, and the story I like to, to lead with here is, you know, I have a six, one, two, two boys, and a six-year-old, they were in a grocery store, and um, you, you know, mommy, mommy, look, the cash register says I, IBM. That's where Nana works. And Nana is a Telugu word, Indian language, for dad. And she was like, yeah, but he doesn't exactly do that. So what we're trying to do with IBM now, you kind of see this new cognitive area, which you'll hear me talk about, is we're trying to be the engine that powers all the cool technology and devices, the remote monitoring device in that pillow, um, the cool devices that Medtronic for glucose monitoring and so forth, all these different devices. 
you don't necessarily have to see IBM's name on it anywhere, but the cognitive computing that helps the data that that device generates, and this is what we're doing at IBM, connect with other data is what we're trying to do with Watson. Now, it's our moonshot. You heard about moonshots earlier today, and, uh, and that's really what it is. This is IBM kind of shifting and evolving, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help all these health systems find ways and partners, because health systems, their IT, either they don't have an IT department, some organizations are lucky and they have innovation centers, they have telehealth centers, and they have all these great resources to help them with the technology. Many of them don't. And the ones that don't need to find partners, like a Medtronic or a different company, uh, to help them develop the tech, pay for the tech, and then we as IBM, with Watson, our cognitive capabilities, build the foundation to connect all that data together. And one, other, one of the, the, the drums you're hearing me beat is the less that Epic and Cerner and those folks talk to each other, I don't care what pledge they made today and the same pledge they made three years ago, the better for us. We'll connect it, we'll create data lakes, and we'll put all that data together because the devices are creating what kind of data? Structured data. Without, and, um, and we talked about it this morning in that vignette of that patient that you were on the phone with, the, 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 the ruptured spleen um, and had that, uh, uh, that skull fracture. We're connecting all the other data. We want to connect that to that device's data to give the complete patient picture so that the provider, doctor, nurse, whomever, can give the right care to the right patient at the right time. And that's what we're trying to do with IBM so that when you look at it, it's not a mainframe anymore. It's a cognitive engine that's giving you the insights. And, yeah, and you, that brings something up, I think, that I, I'd like to put to all three of you uh, and then turn it back to you. I was talking to Dr. Mark McClellan last night, uh, who was uh, our first speaker, uh, former FDA commissioner, former director of CMS, and I was the first chief medical officer of drcoop.com. Most of you are probably too young to remember C. Everett Coop. But Dr. Cooper, I used it. <laughs> I used it. <laughs> and uh, you remember the beard? He was the first one who was against smoking. <laughs> and we were the first medical information site. We went bankrupt because the business deal was not good. And Time Warner gave WebMD $100 million. Be that as it may, <laughs> we found out that A, people don't pay for information. And B, the major issue was one of security. And what Mark said to me last night, and I, I've reported on this. I, I reported on uh, a company called CrowdMed uh, who uh, tells people that they're going to help make their diagnosis, which they don't. But be that as it may, uh, they say four times on their site that people should didact, black out their uh, medical record name before they upload it. And people don't, so they're not responsible. So here's the major question for all of us. In, uh, interpretation in connectivity for care and action and for everybody here is security and uh, of course which has been a major focus for us what McClellan and I both think and we're not technologists is it would be nice if the door were closed and the user had to open it instead of the door is open and the user has to close it I'm sure you all understand what I mean It'd be nice if the data are, is part of connectivity now. We do automatic data collection with everything from interpretive services to telehealth. That's great for studies, but how do we keep it secure and is there a way to have it shut to begin with? Uh, you know, and forgive me, Microsoft was talking yesterday about how that <laughs> door is closed before it's open. But what are we doing about ensuring the security and taking it the next step? Let me start on this end and then move that way. Back to Dorcas. So, I mean, it's a really key issue, the whole issue of data security, cyber security, and otherwise. This is something where I don't think, personally, anyway, I don't think this is something that one individual player decides in the, in, in the scheme of things. This is something because the, the nature of the data we're talking around is that it's going to move between many different players in the field. So this is something where I think is really an issue around regulation. So both at the moment adhering and making sure one follows a regulatory pathway, but also I think one has to look to this being 
really regulation deciding exactly how it needs to go. Because I think, as I say, otherwise, to get lots of different players trying to do this in lots, lots of different ways will itself be a cause of issues. So I know both we and here it's absolutely fundamental in terms of data security, cyber security. Um, it's in all the details of how one links data and thinks about data related to patients. And I think that it's really the regulatory, f reg regulatory um, framework. So um, around this, there's therefore a, t a tension, isn't there? There's on the one hand, the, the need for this to be as open as possible, to be able to allow this connectivity, to allow the, the linkage. But on the other hand, there's the downside of doing it. So a lot of what we've heard, a lot one does here, is visions about the future and thinking what it looked like. I think it's important that this area is really addressed proactively. So as we're looking as we go forward, the you know, regulation really stays with this and stays ahead of the game rather than finding out we're having to do things in, in retrospect. So Dr. DeMarshall, what are yeah. you doing at Mayo Clinic and what's yeah. your experience there? I, I, I completely agree. I think this is, this is about uh, establishing and adhering to national and international standards and, and through, reg, through regulation. I, I, uh, I, I have recently had an experience with our Center for Connected Care uh, on, on, this, on this note. Um, <clears throat> It, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a precautionary measure uh, to, to others that might experience it, there clearly one wants not for the data to be to be um, uh, to be in the in the wrong or unintended hands, but uh, organizations organizations sometimes have uh, committees that are responsible for security. That are not working, are not working constructively with with members of a center for telehealth. In other words, uh, to your to your point, what we'd like to see is uh, a, uh, a proactive approach, so that those responsible for security within an organization are working proactively with those individuals of an organization that wish to develop and implement connected care and ensure that the vehicles by which they are, uh, the, the, the vehicles that are being established for connected care meet the regulatory standards that, that you're speaking of, as opposed to circumstances which I'm witnessing, not only in our organization, but at others, the teams responsible for security uh, are engaged after the fact and may, and may have a tendency then to to uh, obstruct or impede or cancel progress, and 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 everyone means well, but had they been engaged, had the had the had the two groups worked constructively at the outset, then the product would likely be safe from the security standpoint and ready to implement, as opposed to uh, being held up. Okay, Dr. Dahagan. Yes. Um, so yeah, I agree with the, the the regulation piece, and I just drew a little sting here. And you know, there's regulation is one part of it. And uh, Shauna, I saw her walk out, but in her talk, she mentioned uh, protocols. And you know, what are some of the red flags potentially of when when you're working with organizations and you hear a protocol, I got to do this, I got to that, you should worry. So that happened to me in clinical medicine. Protocols everywhere are not demonstrated um, to actually improve outcomes from a quality and utilization standpoint. We see it all the time. Um, it gets frustrating. Actually, one of the reasons I left clinical medicine to say, all right, well, I need to work on the side that's going to help us find the data and evidence to change those protocols. So when I hear regulation, I hear protocols, and then I hear, I want to break rules. That's what I see on the inside. I want to break the rules. I want to change them. So if you're going to change the rules, and this is the way we approach it, uh, you have to be very, very calculated in the way that you do it. And how can you be calculated if you don't look at all the data? Then when you look at the data, you have to validate. By breaking this rule, I made an improvement. So we go from an area of regulation. You find loopholes, kind of what I try to do, in the data that helps you figure out this is the data that validates that that protocol is absurd. All right, so you validate. Once you validate, then you can now begin to demonstrate that we can go to the next TIO and personalization. Because we need to go from regulation, regulation, which is trying to say for the general public, for everyone, do this, and they'll all be great. No, we know that's not true. But we are also trying to get to and reconcile that with personalization. We're all trying to get to personalized medicine, trying to go that direction. We have to be able to validate what regulation is legit, 
what, validate, what, what regulation is absurd, and then how can we reverse it to go to personalization? And that's what we're trying to do at Watson. And I say we, I've been, you know, you're only, full disclosure to everyone here, I've been with IBM Watson for, or IBM for five months. Before that, I did health IT consulting, and before that, I was in scrubs and, you know, trying to, you know, hate the world. Like, not necessarily like Z-Dog, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I've referenced him twice already. But, um, so that's what we're trying to do at IBM Watson, is get all this data. We have a machine to help us handle the volume and the velocity of this data, which, by the way, while we're anal analyzing that data, it's still multiplying. It's not stopping. So we're using that to validate our hypotheses. What hypotheses does Watson come back with, for example, from a machine learning, to say, look at this correlation, and then how does that help us change the regulation then we validate it, and then we get to personalization. So, so just to, to that's use, my soapbox again. Use that as a, <laughs> as a segue to the two-edged sword, because I need to get you involved. Otherwise, we're just going to talk. We've only got 25 <laughs> minutes. So how many of you um, are, are aware of the issue that Apple is having with the FBI about the phones? In OK. How many of you believe that Apple should allow the FBI to open that phone? How many of you believe? They should not. OK. So there you have it, although the should nots are much greater. Our Constitution was written to say that personal freedom is above all else except when it interferes with the public, with the general public. If it endangers the freedom of the general public, then personal freedom is no longer high. So the idea of being able to get the data to decide which data is, should be secure, yep. and which is not, that is uh, you know, what we call a conundrum. It is a difficult question. Love to hear what you have to say about it. Is there anybody who has a question for any of our experts here? Dr. Edwards, you must have a question. I don't know if you're here. How about one of the care and action teams? Nothing? <laughs> any thoughts on this about what we're doing to ensure? I mean, what do, what do we run across when we're trying to, at Care in Action, to ensure, I want to talk about the nuts and bolts uh, of, of security. Is this the same question that exists uh, uh, when we're building the highways? Uh, and is it more difficult? Then we can throw it back here. So going back to the, the question about regulation. Introduce yourself. So. Hi, I'm Scott Pack. I'm the senior security engineer for Care in Action. So going back to the question about regulation, there are lots of um, looking at HIPAA, high tech, omnibus, all that stuff, I've yet to speak with anybody who doesn't say it's pretty much an abomination. There's a lot of really good ideas, and that's about where it stops. So while, yes, we need some kind of standardization, some kind of enforcement to go through to at least measure ourselves against to set a minimum bar, what do you feel about legislated or federally enforced or international commission oversight and guidance as opposed to the industry itself coming up with something. Good. I mean, that, that really turns back. So let's start with Dr. DeMarshall this time since he's the clinician. <laughs> well, my response would be I would, I would, be, I would, welcome, I would welcome such a thing. I, I, I think if there's, if there's something that we've learned uh, in our organization, <clears throat> To be successful in this domain, um, to, to play to our organizational strength, which is, which is largely the, the, the clinical provision of care and the expertise, uh, we've, we've recognized, like other health organizations, that partnerships are key and partnerships with, with, uh, with technological companies uh, are key. So uh, I think many healthcare organizations would completely welcome what you're proposing, um, and and to, to to learn to learn from to learn from your expertise, uh, and and you and utilize that as as a as a as a standard. Uh, it, it appears that the the industry's recommendations uh, often outpace what is set as a national or an international standard, which is perhaps the point you were trying to make. Dr. Dahagam? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's the world, unfortunately, that we live in. And we have to figure out, um, so I'll, I'll step back a little bit. When we think about those policies, those government regulations, HIPAA, high tech, omnibus, whatever, they, whatever comes out, 
I'm going to ask actually Dr. DeMarshall a question here. How many of those policies had, do you think, clinical input from clinicians, people at, on the boots on the ground taking care of patients? Well, virtually, I mean, just negligible. Right. I was going to say it's like a medical school multiple choice exam. You have 100%, 0%, some random number in the middle. It's n never the extreme. <laughs> in this one, it actually is. It's like very close to zero. I mean, it's not zero, but there's some out there. Mm -hmm. And that's been the challenge of it. We've had people who don't really understand how to take care of patients. I work at an IT company that's trying to do something in healthcare, and they don't have a lot of clinicians who are doing the work. How is that reconcilable, similar to any policy, whether it's government or private? So the first step is to have an entity demonstrate that the metrics, that the policies they have in place are not generalizable. And um, we're trying to give a roadmap here. So the way that, to answer your short answer to your question is, it's the world we live in, we gotta change it. How are we gonna change it is kind of where I'm branching into, which is we have to find an entity, maybe it's private, but maybe it's governmental, maybe, it, but it has to be driven by data that makes sense to patients and providers. Uh, it's not a procedural metric or a process metric or a core measure that, yes, you get 100% and you, you shave the patient's abdomen in the OR, they're still getting, I mean, it doesn't matter if it doesn't connect to outcomes. So whether it's going to be a machine that helps us, and you'll, that's my soapbox, obviously, whether there's a machine that helps us get the data to demonstrate which rules, which regulations are the ones that truly do benefit outcomes, where, do we, where can we anonymize, where do we have to keep it personal, where does PHI, PII, how much can we glean by stripping it out? You can glean a lot. Um, and then going from there to change the policies, working closely with clinicians who are seeing the patients, doctors, nurses, interpreters, all of those folks, um, that's what it's gonna take. So I, I mean, yeah, I hope that answers your question somewhat. <laughs> Did it? Yes. <laughs> I, I can tell you, last night, uh, when I was sitting uh, with Mark McClellan, uh, McClellan looked at me, and you know, here's somebody who was involved with regulating, first, drugs, and secondarily, with regulating CMS, you know, yeah. which regulates Medicare, among other things. Uh, and he looked at me, and he said, well, you're a journalist. How would you do it? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, you were FDA commissioner and CMS director. How would you do it? And he said, I don't know. And this is a true story. And he would say that, uh, honestly, if he were here. I wish we still had some government person here. The point is, coming up with, you know, what is the way, if you build a system that is totally closed door, so that it's totally secure, I'm not even saying that's possible, but totally, 100% secure. And the only way it was openable was by one physician or the patient themselves. Then you've got regulation at a level that many people would object to. If you build a system that is openable by more people or is by its nature open, I never thought I'd know this much about this stuff, <laughs> is, or want to, that by then you have, you don't have as much regulation but you have incredible danger. I go back to the story of CrowdMed, and this guy actually looked at me on network TV, and he said, it's not my fault. We told them they should didact their names, you know? And I spoke to three people whose medical records had gone up on Google because they hadn't removed their own names. And he said, well, it's not, and he's right. Nobody could sue him because they signed responsibility away, but these patients were victimized by something that they were seeking help through. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is incredibly frustrating. All right, I'll turn it back to you then. Um, how, I don't wanna stay on the same subject. So let's just switch to the innovations themselves. I started my talk yesterday very briefly with the fact that one of the first things I reported on in 1988, when I was seven years old, uh, was the addition of the carnival light to the speculum, which every insurance company, which, as you know, every insurance company now versus then were completely different, paid 50 bucks for. And $2 billion later, it was found not to be useful, which is part of the reason it's sort of, you know, those of you who have seen the big short, everybody was getting credit too easily. Well, I could argue that in the 80s and early 90s, uh, insurance was paying for too much, which is why they're now paying for so little compared to what they should be paying for. So 
how about the innovations? Let me start with you, Dr. DeMarshall. The innovations, how does a, an organization like Mayo Clinic evaluate, because this is what this conference is about, a new innovation to determine, will this be right for my patients? Uh, will it return enough on investment to make it worthwhile with fewer side effects? How do you, what, what is involved with evaluating those? Yeah. Telehealth among them. Yeah. Uh, well, the telestroke example within the Center for Connected Care uh, is a good example of, of, the, of, the, of the rigor required. <clears throat> and I'll, and I'll, share, I'll share our, our story uh, in my presentation. I'll share it in, in, in detail. But, but suffice it to say, uh, we are striving for and would recommend that for these new innovative technologies or even telehealth programs, which is certainly more than the technology, that they, that they, that they be evaluated. And at the start, it's a matter of, of understanding whether um, the, the, the process or procedure is, is reliable, is it valid, uh, is it safe, uh, is it efficacious, clinically effective, and, and ultimately, is it cost effective? Or, or even ideally cost savings. Um, this is a laborious process, and it speaks to it speaks to the science necessary beyond beyond the technological innovation or beyond the introduction of the technology into a new consultative process within connected care. Be, beyond that, there there is a laborious process of study necessary. What what uh, what conflicts with this is the is the the pace at which the market, uh, the the consumer, clinical providers, healthcare organizations, and the technological innovators and organization companies wish to uh, wish wish to move things along. I, I from my vantage point, there uh, there are many examples of consultative processes and programs in connected care that have not been adequately studied. Um, and uh, telestroke is one, I believe, that has been adequately studied. But if we just look at the field of neurology, what we're discovering is that many other connected care neurological programs have been developed and built on the back of telestroke, really with insufficient evidence. In other words, they all point to the fact that, well, if it worked in stroke, it will or could work in other neurological syndromes. But, but that remains to be proven. So uh, I, my answer to your question is it's laborious. Uh, and and uh, globally, there is such demand for this work, for, for, for the domain of connected care in all of its facets, that, that the demand sometimes um, uh, doesn't, doesn't allow for adequate evaluation. Dr. Dehagen. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, it, it kind of dovetails a little bit on that one in that when we are assessing, and, and I do this day in and day out, uh, my official title is healthcare business development lead, but really I'm a healthcare solutions development lead for the IBM Watson ecosystem. And every time I'm in a conversation with a startup, I work with startups, large companies, EHR vendors, health systems, et cetera. And I use the same lens. And those of you who are clinicians, there's no such thing as a VIP patient. There's no such thing as a VIP organization. No VIP startup. No one is a VIP. Everyone comes in, and I assess them the same way. And I try to apply a scientific method to it. So there's a hypothesis that what we are about to build is going to be scientifically and clinically impactful and significant. OK? How are we measuring that? What are the materials and methods? Great. It's technically feasible, and its innovative potential is high. OK, great. How are you assessing that? And then the third, and again, this is my soapbox, I'm beating a dead horse. I'm telling you, I have three check boxes. Literally, I do everything the same way. I'm a surgeon. I have to do the same thing every, every way. Um, the, what is the value from a business perspective, from a cost perspective, financial, et cetera? How are we saving money? How are we increasing revenues and reimbursements, what have you? So applying that same methodology. Then the last part of that is what I love about you. If we're going to take this grand endeavor, and we're going, and I start everyone, moonshot, grand vision is what folks will hear. I think Jamie and some folks when I talk to Karen Action have heard this. What is your grand vision? If you could build anything, what would it be? Okay, we design that, it's a use case, we work backwards and so forth. But the big question, coming back to your point, 
is how is this going to be repeatable? Scientific method. How do we repeat this for other specialties? If we build this for orthopedics, can we repurpose it, just making a few tweaks, to cardiology, to neurology, to pharmacy, to all the other areas in a hospital and health system that are, to interpretive services, to all these different components? That's the way we, that's the way we assess it. And those ones that are, are the ones that are going to be truly the ones, from a technology standpoint at least, that may have the potential to, from a clinical and scientific standpoint, to really improve outcomes. Then we build a prototype, validate it, and then we say, look, we validated this, change the regulation. We want to do this. And then, you know, that's kind of how I approach it now. It doesn't always work out that way, but, you know, I, I, I went in to break rules. <laughs> I think it's a perfect place to sort of sum up here because what this conference is all about is making decisions about you know what is valid what is not individually for your companies deciding what will work what will provide patient satisfaction provide a satisfaction return on investment decreased risk the problem is sometimes you don't know that till after you've been doing it for a while